I'm honored to be here at SOAS as a humble student of Sasanian history who is just beginning to learn a bit more and more about the Sasanian, to be invited actually uh, to this uh, university to speak uh, about the Sasanians and perhaps some of these strange ideas I have about how to go about studying uh, the area from Oxus to Euphrates uh, for about a thousand years. I would like to thank, of course, Dr. Sarah Stewart and Dr. Vesta Sakoch Curtis for the kind invitation. I thank you. Uh, I would also like to just dedicate, if this talk is worthy at all, to the memory of Iraja Afshar, a great colleague and a master, I should say, who I learned very much from and who was actually awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award of ISIS here about six years ago. So I hope you have the handout. A two-page handout should be back to back. The reason for my talk. The reason for my talk uh, is that one, as I said, I dabble in Sasanian history, and I would like to uh, suggest that Sasanian history uh, is important and it has a, a long durée effect, you might say. As I've been teaching ancient and medieval Iranian history in separate quarters, as Padwana mentioned, you really can't understand the medieval one without understanding some of the basic issues of the ancient one, and you can't really understand the medieval history without knowing some of the ancient material. And this is a problem that I see with my students, and it is logical, there's a problem here. They need to know uh, the literary production and the mindset and the mentality of these people in order to understand how they act, react, and interact with their neighbors and the surrounding world. Uh, as a world historian, or I dabble in world history, you might say, I think the way uh, that the history of the Middle East is categorized, it is defined, uh, is problematic. That is, uh, we need to go beyond political boundaries and dynastic histories uh, in order to study the pre-modern history of the Middle East. And I would like to suggest a model for it, for the pre-modern, at least before the Mongol conquest. And the third one I would like to, of course, push uh, in this Oxus to Euphrates uh, part of the world, the idea of a Persianate world. And that is perhaps because I have the title too with my uh, sort of a uh, professorship, I should also advertise that part, the Persian as well. So how would I do that? Would such a thing, uh, an idea, make sense? Well, uh, please look at Roman numeral one, where I suggest uh, that indeed there is an idea of what I call Iran Shah, from the Oxus to Euphrates, uh, which makes sense as a cultural unit as a cultural <coughs> which is being enhanced by the work of Padron and others, I think, as well, who have come to understand the importance of the Sasanians and the idea of continuity, rather than rupture, with the Arab Muslim conquest. Uh, and these are from various disciplines. Those who deal with late antique history uh, have certainly uh, now looked east of the uh, Euphrates more and more. Uh, as the Sasanian Empire is this other important uh, empire of late antiquity beside the Roman world. Uh, Islamic historians, or those who deal with early Islamic history, have now recognized the importance of Sasanian for this idea of how this early Islamic world came into being. I would just mention Michael Morton, my own professor, and of course Hugh Kennedy, who now has taken, I think, charge of this uh, in the UK, as far as I'm concerned, uh, in promoting this idea, as well as Padmanov, of course, who has worked on Khorasan and now also is very interested in the Parthians, even in the Sasanian period and perhaps before it. And uh, I think others such as, as Talmudist, I could only mention Yaakov Elman, a, a great Talmudist but also an Iranist, I would suggest, who have uh, now shown us new ways of thinking about this late antique world and how the communal sort of religious uh, uh, you know, inhabitants of Iran Shah uh, interacted with each other. That is the uh, Jewish population for Yaakov Elman. Uh, we have other scholars who work on Syriac here. Uh, some of us, uh, some among us here, who actually uh, have, again, really opened up 
uh, our eyes into how to perhaps go about and study um, late antique and early zombies. Now, Iran Shah, the Persian Emperor, could it be relevant? Could it be used as a model as such? And the reason I would like to push this issue is for another practical reason <coughs> and perhaps a disciplinary reason. Uh, I do see that Iranists and those who specifically dealt with Iran, I did some of this, I had to do Iranian languages and so on. Uh, uh, as time has gone on, we have become a bit isolated and I don't want us to be insulated and the feel of Iranian cities become irrelevant or God forbid, the death of the feel of Iranian studies because we only talk to ourselves. And I think these various people have, of course, are, are making it change. And so I think there's a cultural or a civilizational unit in the Oxus to Euphrates from about 200 to 1200 that could save us perhaps or give us another uh, way of making this Iranian world uh, relevant. <coughs> so please look at the Roman handout, uh, Roman numeral 2 on that handout. Here I have supplied the uh, dates and the capitals, perhaps, and the genealogies, or at least some of the genealogies, which first and foremost, uh, uh, Bosworth has also mentioned, that is where I have looked at most of them, uh, suggests so who they are related to genealogically, uh, when they're approximately ruling, and from where they are ruling, most of them from the post Sasanian period. Now, I think all of these people, all of these dynasties, are culturally, uh, I can use this negative term, imprisoned uh, by the idea of Iran Shah. Let me give you an example. The last dynasty on this list is the Qarakhanids, who are ruling all the way in Kashgar in western China. They are Turkic noble tribes, and they are responsible for the Divan el and they're very much aware of their ancestry, and they want to let everyone know that they are Turkic noble tribes. How do they do that? Well, they do this to, to show this. They connect themselves to Afrosyal. Well, who's Afrosyal? Afrosyal is the king of Turan in the uh, what we know as the Shahnameh, which probably uh, was already composed in the sixth century in the form of Quran. That is, even these noble Turkic tribes on the western edge of China can only play a part on an already established narrative of the past, which is established and codified by the Sasanian Empire. That is through the work of the Khudar Nomad and ultimately with the Samanids, the Shahnameh. Now, I am not going to bore you with reading uh, the genealogical connections between the Tahrids, the Safaris, the Samanids, and so on. But you can see they all relate to a mythical or a dynastic ruling uh, uh, kingdom of uh, the Iranian world, which is part of the production, of, if you might say, of the oral or written, I'm not even going to get into that, of uh, this uh, idea of Iran Shah or of the Iranian world. So it is only descent via this tradition that makes sense to people uh, in this region that I'm talking about. If you look at Roman uh, 3, what do I mean by Iran Shah? Well, that I can actually give you a little bit more ideas because I just know a bit more. And that is that the Sasanians do some very interesting things. With all due respect to Padua, which I think that the, uh, the fall of Sasanians is very important, we have been so fixated on the fall of the Sasanians that, uh, at least among some community, we forget that the importance of Sasanians is far more than this negative attitude that we have towards the Sasanians. Uh, that is, culturally, uh, they have done something very important. The first and foremost is the idea of a territory called Iran Shah, which later comes to be Iran. Uh, that is the realm of the Iranians, uh, is, of course, concocted, created, however you want to mention it, during the Sasanian period. They use their uh, traditional religious literature or uh, tradition and transpose an idea of what they call the Shah on this landmass of this Iranian plateau. Uh, we find that 
Eventually, by the fourth century and the fifth century, certainly the legal texts, such as the Madhyani Hazar Dabestan, we do have a legalistic approach to the idea of who is part of the Sinan Shah. So you get terminology such as Marde Shah and Zane Shah, that's B, Roman numeral 3B, and Bandage Shah. So we have men and women of the empire, I would say men and women, citizen women of the empire, and even the slaves of oh, again, citizen slave as opposed to an Bandaga and Shahri, a non-citizen uh, slave, and so on. Uh, they also discuss, at least these Middle Persian texts, if you look at, of course many are from the post ascending period, but I think uh, they carry on that sort of mentality and worldview, the idea of an Iranian character, disposition. I would just uh, use the Middle Persian term, minishni, uh, that is mentioned, what is an Iranian, how they should behave, what should they think. And of course, with that comes part of this aristocratic, at least what we know, of a culture, what we know in Middle Persian as Farhang, or for most of us as Farhang. What it is someone who needs to know about its culture to be part of this Iranian world. And you know, when you look at these Middle Persian texts on chess and backgammon, the idea of jousting, the hunt, uh, uh, if you look at other Middle Persian texts, uh, how to write swiftly, how to use different kinds of pens, to know your religion, and to know about your past, your history, are all of these things that perhaps you went to Afrahangistan, a place to acquire these ideas. And the last thing I mentioned was the idea of history. And uh, at least from the circumstantial evidence that we have from the Sasanian period, uh, via Egatheus, right? Via Sevios, Armenian historian, historian, and also from other avenues, uh, that indeed there was a uh, history composed uh, called the Quadrangle of Lords. And I think it's these activities and agendas by the society that create a cultural view of the Sviran Shah that doesn't simply die with the Arab Muslim conquest. But rather, the, the idea survives in various ways. And that is very important. And that is why the Qarakhanids are using that genealogy, and they are discussing themselves in that way. And that is why the Safarids, or the Buyids, or the Samanids, or the Ziyarids, want to say that they matter in this region because they are part of this narrative that the Sasanians have already created. And nothing much has changed, except for one Muslim. And so, is it um, con the contradictory to be a Muslim and be part of Iran Shah or this idea of Iran Shah? I would suggest not. I would suggest already in the 5th and the 6th century, this idea goes beyond the is issue of associating Iran Shah or Iran with Zoroastrianism. And that is something we could, of course, discuss during the question and answer. Uh, in terms of historiography, they also. Uh, their view of things is quite different from, let's say, the classical world. And I would suggest that this causes a lot of trouble in relation to the Roman and the Sasanian world. The Romans have the, uh, the very sort of classical narrative of the Greeks, Alexander, the Romans on the west and on the eastern side, you have the, uh, the Achaemenid Empire, the Parthians, or the Arsaces, and the Sasanians. But that is not uh, what the Sasanians think and this view of Iran is all about. Rather, uh, initially, everyone was part of the same tradition. There is a division of this world between uh, Iraq, Turaq, which is me, and Sad, right? Uh, our father sort of uh, divided us, and hence the world of the wars, or the wars of the world, begun. And in some way, they're always related, although they're enemies and fighting each other. We have interesting uh, recollections of the Shahnameh, where, for example. Uh, Postural parties is in trouble as far as to go to Rome, they are your ancestors. They will help you. So there are always these provocations of some connection, although there is war. Uh, and this war is because of this initial mythological, if you want to talk about it, division that has caused the war of the world. And all of these dynasties, I think, are attuned to this. And know this, while the Romans, of course, don't initially in late antiquity. Uh, please look at Roman numeral 6.